Hello, welcome back to another episode of Collider Jedi Council. I'm Christian Harloff, a.k.a. Darth Harloff, and this is the show where we talk about Star Wars. Very excited. The original panel, it's on today. It is the council. First, the Smith Lord. She is back once again. Hello, Tiffany Hi, Smith. Hi, I'm happy to be back. And sitting next to her, it's Obi John Kenobi, John Campion. Woo! Oh, the Talking energy's Star high. Wars. I just want to point out, though, yeah. the original crew was just you and me. And against oh, my and Maud, suggestions, Maud. you brought these two. Oh, that's right. I right, just right. wanted to point that correct. out. Why? I mean, I'm glad you're here now. That's true. Technically, it is true. The original, the original gangsters are me <laughs> and me and you. All right, sitting next to John is Mark <laughs> to D two. You the one that got cannot me. rain on my parade, Mr. Campion. My socks are full of positive mana, and I want. <laughs> give a shout out to Van, who's a huge fan of Jedi Council and his band Waters. Check him out. Team White. What? Uh, <laughs> we were talking context. about Magic the Gathering context. before. We're it's talking about, about the decks context. we play with. Some people play a black deck. Some people play a white deck. I go white green, Christian. I go red black. I'm going to move to the first topic. Uh, <laughs> it's time for Star Wars movie news. Everything happening in the world of the movie news. We're going to talk about it. Mark. What is going on this week in Star Wars movie news? Well, if you've been following our coverage of Rogue One, it should come as no surprise to anybody that Mads Mikkelsen is talking a lot about Rogue <laughs> One. The guy who just cannot keep his trap shut in a fun, light way is talking more about his director, about one of his co-stars, and about those pesky reshoots that everybody wants to chat about. First up, Christian Gareth Edwards, he says that Gareth really got the story right. He said he was really impressed with the director's ability, and that a lot of times when you're doing a Star Wars film, it can feel like this huge, big universe, but Edwards managed to shoot scenes where they felt small and intimate, which I thought was cool because we do want to tell a smaller story within mm -hmm. this universe. And then he had a lot of, you know, just normal actor talk when he's talking about how great Felicity Jones was to work with and the reshoots. It doesn't seem like they're as extensive as one would come to believe if we trust Mr. Mickelson. So you see all these comments, all these different topics about Rogue One. Which one of them stood out to you? Um, not the stuff about Felicity Jones and not the reshoots because that's political stuff and I get it now and not to say that the stuff about Gareth Edwards isn't ex isn't exactly political but it's nice to see an actor protecting his director and I think to me it's like uh, after you know that regardless of what is true or what isn't true there are tons of reports out there with people speculating that Gareth Edwards cut is not the cut Disney wanted. Whether it's true or not, it's out there and people are talking about it. We certainly talked about it the last two weeks. And, and this is Matt saying, uh, every, just really protecting the guy, talking about how much he likes working with him. And it's nice to see a guy who's really respected in the community. Even though he's not a big, huge star, he's very respected, especially in our mm -hmm. community. And to hear him saying that, I think it's a good thing. So that's the one that stands out to me. How about you? Uh, first of all, I just like the picture that we picked because it's like probably how he feels where he's like, oh man, did I say too much again? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the part that really stood out to me is where he's talking about Gareth as a director and that it's these really intimate scenes because we were talking so much about the reshoots and that's what they were saying they wanted more of that they were like they were missing those intimate right. moments and he's saying that's what he Gareth was so good at that they built in so much of that into the actual script so that for me I'm, I'm gonna put it out there when John was like it was a bunch of BS with all the stuff that was coming out because of what Mads is saying here I feel a little bit more like that is the case that because of what yeah, yeah because because that was what a lot of it was that people were saying it was because there wasn't enough small intimate moments that the action was so big and great that they had to do more reshoots to build in more of that but with what Mad's saying he's like we had so many of those scenes and he talks about the stuff with Felicity a little bit doesn't spoil too much which I was proud of him for not spoiling um, <laughs> but so I think that was the biggest thing that stood out for me where it's like okay yeah he defended his director but he also kind of said what everyone was hoping for that that small intimate moments, so those are gonna be there in this film. John? You see, I'm gonna argue against myself yeah. for a second a little bit. I I just agree with know, you. I know, I know, which is like, <laughs> oh, the irony. <laughs> um, I'm gonna argue against myself for, for just a second. First of all, what Mads is proving himself, which we've known for a while, he's proving himself to be a consummate professional. Right. Like he is getting his, uh, you know, co-cast members back. He's getting his directors back. He's getting his projects back. This is what an actor is supposed to do right. when you're still in the midst of making the movie. The reality is, him making these comments, while I think these were the right things for him to say, absolutely, I don't really take anything away from them other than the fact that he's a pro. Right. 
because look, I'm on record. I don't think there is any problem with Rogue One. I think they see things. They, they've watched the cut. This is what Disney do, does now. They've watched the cut and they say, okay, now what can we do different? What, what can we spruce up? What can we prove? I, I believe that, but I don't believe there are any fires that they're trying to put out. I'm on the record of saying that. But if there were, if this movie were a bloody mess, if this were the new Corky Romano of the Star Wars universe, <laughs> I expect that Mads would be saying the exact same thing. He would right. be covering his director's back. He would be covering, he would be talking big about his cast members. Um, so while I, <laughs> I don't believe there's any big problems here, and I do believe he's a pro, I don't necessarily think his words support my position. I don't disagree with you. I just think that it's good that he went out and did it regardless. I totally agree. That's my totally thing. Because I, I, I still don't know, and I'm not I'm not ready to say whether or not I think that it's 100% yes, there's big problems, or 100%. Can't say 100% not, either way. I don't. Yeah. I, what I, the, the thing that just stood out to me is it's the way that he did it and that the way he defended him. It was just like, no, nah, it was a pleasure to work with. It went into detail, and he yeah. did it in a way that he was – a way that a really respected actor would talk <laughs> about a special director. That's my quarterback. Yeah, my quarterback. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's my well, director. please, hopefully that's the last time we compare Rogue One to the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> no. But yeah, look, Mads is a guy that I get from these comments that he loves movies. You know, he loves talking about working with a director. He loves talking about uh, working with his fellow actors and the movie as a whole in these reshoots. Whether or not it's true doesn't really matter because Mads Mickelson will go to bat for you. He's a credit to your project. Just make sure there's not too many twists and turns in the story because Mads may get a little excited and talk about it on a news show right. before yeah. the film comes out. And can out. I just bring us back to center here look we've been so sidetracked about talking about reshoots and this person saying this and these rumors and these rumors are rumors. let's just get back to what we know for a second okay rogue one's trailer is bleeping awesome all right i think i watch that tra i just go every time i hear these new i just go back to that trailer it's like did they catch the tone did they get that that feeling that sense that temperature that i want in this movie the answer is always hell yes this movie is going to be awesome bank it all right well, all right, what's next? So you would say, get your popcorn ready. Yes, I would. Yeah. You would say. All right, well, there's some hack named Steven Spielberg, and he made a movie called 1941, and he also <laughs> may have been the reason why we got J.J. Abrams to direct The Force Awakens. Spielberg was telling a story, and it... It, it, he didn't necessarily was the link to get J.J. to Kathleen Kennedy, but he did go to dinner with J.J. and his wife, and he brought up the prospect of, hey, well, what if J.J. Abrams wanted to do a Star Wars movie? I know he just did Star Trek. His wife bought the idea. J.J. Abrams considered the idea. That's when Steven Spielberg got on the phone with Kathleen Kennedy and said, you may want to get a meeting with J.J. because we never know what the future is going to hold. It was a cool little story that Steven Spielberg shared. What was your take, Christian? It's awesome, and you know, it's, it's a cool story on how J.J. did this. Remember, because J.J. said no first he right? he, yes. he had passed it off and said it was because he he just there was so much what well, there's a lot of elements one is that he wanted to go on vacation with his family and he had he'd been working so much he wanted to take off the other thing is that he didn't it's a lot to weigh on to take back star wars and i think that he probably had a lot of conversations with steven spielberg because steven spielberg's been like his mentor for years and years and he even gave him like one of his first jobs when he was coming up as a kid and and he's always been there for him so for this it's kind of like a no-brainer almost to me just because i've been following them for so long and and the, the kind of the relationship that they've had and when we went to the premiere they talked about that um so it was very cool that he's kind of instrumental and he does that a lot with people that he's been working with and helping. He did it with Trevorrow as well. I'm sure that he had a lot of conversations with Trevorrow when he took over Jurassic World. But this particular circumstance, yeah, I'm sure that when Kathleen Kennedy was, when they, when this plan was all coming together, and then she talks to Steven Spielberg, who she's very, very close with, he probably brought up, well, you know, maybe JJ is someone that you should look at. So, yeah, it's, I don't think anybody would be, I don't think anyone thinks he's taking credit for it. And I think it's just a matter of him saying, you know, this is, these are relationships that I have. What do mm -hmm. you think? Mark? I mean, well, it is one of those, it's things that you mentioned is like, yeah, you want to get this this blue chip director to come and do your movie, but sometimes having help in the recruiting process can really make a big impact. Like, if imagine if John Campy was at dinner with Wayne Gretzky. That might influence your decision <laughs> yeah. a little bit. J.J. Abrams grew up idolizing Steven right. Spielberg and loving Star Wars. So when that's the guy, just imagine being at dinner. Imagine being at Giorgio, this fancy restaurant, which we need to go to ASAP in case we run into somebody we know. And you're having dinner with Steven Spielberg and the word Star Wars and him thinking about you doing a Star Wars movie comes out of his mouth. How do you say no to that? We all know that what eventually locked the deal is when Kathleen Kennedy sat down again with JJ and it's like hey what do you think looks guy that's Skywalker guy what do you think he's been up to that's what got him yeah. in but Steven Spielberg certainly helped bridge that gap John? yeah well I mean you just you nailed it I mean when it's Spielberg, because there are 
look, there are a couple of authorities in my life that could maybe get me to do things I might not well, necessarily do. Well, thank you for do. saying that. I appreciate it. Optimus Prime <laughs> and Steven Spielberg. Right. Like, look, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs. Nerd. But if Optimus Prime, <laughs> yeah. But if, Optimus if you could smoke pot with Optimus Prime, you, would but if Optimus you might Prime do it. came to me and said, "John, smoke this crack." John. I'm smoking it's crack. The opposite of everything Optimus Prime stands <laughs> yeah, for. No, but, John, but hit this imagine pole. behind the, these Star Wars pops here. I had a beautiful, cute, oh, adorable baby oh. seal. And if Steven, Steven Spielberg walks and says, "John, hey, uh, club that baby seal to death." I'm like. <laughs> No, Done, no. Steven Spielberg. This is where we, this is where we went. <laughs> what is happening today? Is, what John is happening? John can't be a crack-headed animal yeah. abuser. Oh, the, the my point is, Someone put him in a cell. These are two individuals who could get me <laughs> to do things that I would otherwise never normally do. And if I'm a professional filmmaker like J.J. Abrams, who had worked for him as a teenager, who is, I mean, in my opinion, he's the greatest filmmaker of all time, and he comes to me and says, you should think about doing this movie. It, it, it could have been a $5 movie shot on an iPhone and J.J. Abrams probably would have said yes if it's Steven Spielberg coming to you to say it. So I, I love this story. I think it's great. I think the interesting part of it is the fact that J.J. said to Spielberg first, he was like, "We t I already talked to my family, wasn't going to do any more reboots. Um, and that kind of just leads you into knowing, okay, doing a reboot, what? <laughs> just him calling me a nerd. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got like a, he goes from clubbing a baby seal to a giggle fest. Yeah. I don't know what's happening here. Um, but I feel like the fact that, you know, he talked with his family, he kind of already had an idea of what he was willing and not willing to do. And the fact that Spielberg knows this and was like, let's all go to dinner. And he's like, I'm just going to throw it out there in front of your wife and see what she says. And she was that like, That was kind of uh, dirty now that was. you put it like it that. It was a little bit bad. <laughs> Because it it. like it's like, it, it's one of those things where who knows how, I mean, I'm sure he knows JJ's wife very well at this point too. So it was like, JJ saying this, but I feel like if I say it in front of her, she's going to have a different opinion, which is exactly what happened. And the way they say it played out is that Spielberg just goes outside and he was like, I called Kathleen right then from dinner being like, hey, you should probably talk to JJ about this, which I think is so cool. And it's just another one of those things where whatever career you're in, the mentors that you have and the people you work with, it's so cool when you have really good relationships and you know that the people you work with respect what you do, that they would throw your name into the hat yeah. because that's really what happened. I mean, how crazy is it? And I'm sure there are moments where JJ's like, Steven Spielberg just threw my name into the hat for Star Wars. Like, yeah. that's amazing. But that can work against you too, because we used to have somebody on our team uh, around back when we were still AMC, Amy Rose Eisenbach, and we, we love and adore Amy Rose. But Amy Rose also had played Dirty. Um, so when she had an idea for something and she wasn't quite sure, she wasn't 100% sure whether I'd be on board for it. Her and my wife, her and my wife have a great <laughs> relationship. She would wait till Anne was in the room, and then she'd hit me with the idea, and it's like, well, what am I supposed to say? Yes, yeah. sure. But it's also a thing, you know, Christian. This also speaks to how much Steven Spielberg loves Star Wars. Yes, yeah, it, was, it was it was created by his best friend in the world, George Lucas. But that Steven Spielberg wanted to see more stories in this universe yeah. and cared enough mm -hmm. to go probably pay the tab at Giorgio, not at an inexpensive restaurant, and take J.J. <laughs> Abrams there and convince him that maybe Star Wars is the right idea. That speaks volumes as to how much Spielberg loves this. But I want to see him love it enough and care enough to, to want to one? direct one of well, these. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if that happens. Yeah. So I think what we take out of this is, John, pass the blue crush. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Our first news story is courtesy of Yahoo Movies UK and then the Hollywood Reporter for the Spielberg one. And now we move to Showbiz 411. Their info is that everybody that made Star Wars gets old eventually. That would include John Williams and George Lucas. First up, John Williams, Christian. He got the AFI Lifetime Achievement Award. And even though it's a Lifetime Achievement Award, this thing should have been handed to the guy 20 years ago. I was ago. just going to say, yeah. As soon as they heard the As soon as the Jaws Park theme story, came out. Yeah, it's just it, two chords. <laughs> dun, dun, give yeah, that give man it to him. any sort of statue he wants. So he received that. There's a lot of good quotes within this story. But then one of the other things, and Harrison Ford, great speech about John Williams, by the yeah. way, talking also about how iconic the Indiana Jones theme is. And then George Lucas gets up to the podium and he also mentioned that he is retired officially from making films. So, you know, there's a lot of gray hairs between John Williams and George Lucas, but to celebrate all the work that they have done over the years, that's something that we do on a weekly basis here. Well, I mean, John <laughs> Williams getting a lifetime award, it's, it's yeah, duh. I mean, yeah. of course. Lifetime guy, Achievement Awards were created for, for John Williams. It's a, yeah. He really is. He, it's a, His body of work, it's just some of the best music, just in general, not even just for movies. It's like, it is stuff that you can just listen to. It'll help you think. And it, it's a good, it's a good, like for drives. But what it does for movies, like it just adds, his pieces are characters in movies. They really are. It adds to everything without, you take John Williams' music out of 
the major all of the movies that he's done it's just not the same you could put another great composer in there but it's just not the same for what he's done mm -hmm. And people forget that he came up with the Harry Potter theme. Yep. In the beginning. So he, there's so many things that he did. Superman, Jaws, Jurassic World. I mean, so much. And for him to do, is she humming it right now? Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and I and and it looks like he's going to be back for episode eight. It looks like he, he's going to be doing Indiana Jones. He Ready Player One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he he's going to do Ready, Ready Player, Player One, one. with Steven yeah, Spielberg. Man. I mean, give me another. It's, it's like you just get excited. We were talking about it the other day. Like he, every year he does the Hollywood Bowl here, and we tr yep. you try to go because we don't know how much longer he really wants <clears throat> to do that. And that kind of transitions me into George Lucas as far as he doesn't want to do it anymore. You could tell when he talks about films, like even when he was talking, I say there is anytime George Lucas talks about something in general that he's got a problem not a problem with but that, that he's a little frustration frustration with is that there's a there's always like a sense of uh, you feel a little bit of bitterness a little bit when he's talking about things and i i think that for him it's the same reason that he initially kind of sat back and said i'm not gonna do any more star wars movies is because the prequels and and the way that they were received it it burned him it burned him and he and he was he was kind of hurt by that and i think that even when they interviewed him about i think at, maybe again at the premiere and they asked him about what he's going to be doing next what films and he said nothing that anyone's going to see it's just stuff that i'll do for my friends and family he doesn't want to do it anymore because he doesn't love mm -hmm. to do that anymore like to make the films and we wouldn't want him to do it if he's not loving it i think creating producing he's always going to have his hands and ideas and thoughts to his crew so i think that it makes sense that he's retiring. It's just not something he loves. John? Well, I mean, getting on to John Williams for a second, like what composer in history, really, can you go in 10 bars or less? I can hum in 10 bars or yeah. less, and you will pick mm -hmm. out 10 of them. So if, like, if, okay, so I just go to you. Da, 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 da. It's Close Encounters. There you go. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Indiana Jones. Jaws. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Superman. Dun, dun. Super, yeah. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Damn it. It's like you, can go, you can go on right. and on. And like, it's not that John Williams, I'm so glad you brought up Harry Potter because sometimes people mistakenly think John Williams was a classic guy who did all these classic mm -hmm. things. He's still one of the best in the business. He's still getting nominated for yeah. Academy mm -hmm. Awards. He's still just the guy. And not very often in Hollywood history will you look at creative partnerships like George Lucas and John Williams and what they have done, uh, you know, and so that's just incredible. As far as George Lucas goes and announcing his retirement, I mean, he did kind of, he once retired about four or five years ago, he said right. he was retiring. Came out, tried it again. I honestly think, and this is a shame. Look, I'm one of the people that hate the prequels. I do. So I'm one of them. Yeah. But I think the amount of, I, I was never one of those guys who was like, though, George Lucas raped my childhood, right. like, anything like that. Like, I still always worship at the, at the altar of George Lucas. But I think the amount of, not just that people didn't like it, the fact that people needed to make movies about why... Uh, the prequel sucked and, and things like I mean how many times the phrase George Lucas raped my childhood was thrown out there I think it killed his love of the art and I don't blame him for that but you know what I think when it's all said and done when we think of George Lucas we're not going to think about the Star Wars prequels because who, who gives a flying right. rat we're going to think about the guy who revolutionized the industry, not just Star Wars, not just Indiana Jones. We're talking ILM. We're talking Dolby. We're talking Skywalker Sound. We're talking like all these Pixar, ways. That, right? And really, the, the digital cinema is now the way it's just the way of the normal thing. But it's the only reason it's normal now is because George Lucas forced it to be that way. I mean, he's been such an innovator all this time. If he's finally now gonna step back and say, I am officially done, I'm just gonna relax, enjoy my kids, enjoy my $5 billion. Right. And good more. on you, George. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good on you, George, seriously. Tiff? I think one of the coolest parts that really stood out was when Harrison was talking about uh, John Williams and just saying that, you know, in Indiana Jones and you choosing to use the music and it only shows up when Indy thinks that she's passed away and that right. like that's the first time that but that's her song. Um, I think and he said basically he's like he brings art to a whole nother level. That's right. when it's really art. And I thought that was so cool because it really is something where it's like we've talked about this with even the Marvel films where it's like there is no real like you don't think of a song and tie it to a character the nope. way that John Williams does and he said something funny where it was like he doesn't want he was like I'm gonna do another Star Wars which yay that was another thing that really stood out because he said he doesn't want anybody else to write for Daisy Ridley which I was like that was so <laughs> sweet and one of those things where it is you know you do get really attached to 
the sounds and the songs that he creates for certain characters. Right. And that's what I think he's so brilliant at. And, and, and it made me so excited because Ready Player One is one of my favorite books. And so I'm really excited to see what he's going to do with that one. And then on the George Lucas stuff, it's interesting because to me, it almost reminds me of like, which is a weird comparison maybe, but what Kevin Smith has said about doing film where it's like he was really excited about doing it at first and, you know, fans and geeks got really on board with his original first stuff. And now it's like, He's just making movies because he wants to make them however yeah. he wants to make them. And so it's like there it could be really interesting if George Lucas was like, I'm going to start doing smaller stuff that could possibly end up at like a South by Southwest or a Sundance or something like that. That would be really cool because I feel like it's more about the fact that he's not seeking broad appeal anymore. And so it's like as soon as George does something and it doesn't get a massive audience, then all of a sudden we're like, oh, he like the audience comes out and fans are like he failed. And it's like. No, if he wants to just do artistic stuff for him, then do that. Because I would be on board for seeing that. When he talks about doing stuff for friends and family, I'm like, can I? Can, can I be? be can I be in that uh, mix? Yeah. Can I be in your quick dial list? Yeah. Mark, three questions for you. Hit me. The one, uh, John Williams, thoughts on that? Okay. Two, George Lucas retiring. I can do that. Three, will you ever give me back my Ready Player One book? <laughs> um, I'm still reading it. Wait, he, I'm, I'm reading the book. He's reading a book. No, when I'm he done hasn't with it, it. I will give it back. Have you started it? I'm reading the book no, currently. He's had it for like a year. And when I'm yeah, done with say, it, how long ago? a year, and he's never and he's never even picked up. It's the, right the book. there on the bathroom, on the back of the toilet. And as soon as I get to you it, you know what? You can keep it. All right, <laughs> uh, uh, go ahead. Give me your thoughts. <laughs> uh, I'll start with George Lucas because George Lucas is a guy that I might disagree with you all a little bit, but I think we're going to arrive at the same conclusion: is that I think George Lucas doesn't want to retire. I think that he desperately wants to keep making films that do have a broad appeal, but he just doesn't want to handle the criticism anymore. I think it hurt him so bad with the prequels that as much as he does have these ideas and he wants to get them out to the widest audience possible, he just it just hurts the guy too much, and he's so gun-shy with it now that he just doesn't want to take the risk anymore, which right. is something I can totally understand, and he does want to make these more experimental movies that he is afraid would get a huge backlash if he released them wide, so he's just going to keep them for himself and he has every right to do that with john williams just listen to the score from the adventures of Tintin that steven spielberg mm. did not too long ago and it's like oh yeah john williams still has it then you listen mm -hmm. to the force awakens and it's like the guy still has it i questioned him a little bit during the prequel era because i don't love so did the I. scores from the prequels i think duel of fates is cool there's some okay stuff in there just none of it really resonated with me and then to see him be able to continue to compose work for movies and to have it be all-time greats even as recently as he has is such a monumental achievement the guy's ears and his eyes work so well in concert when he's scoring a movie a couple quick quotes from george lucas is it star wars was meant to be a simple hero's journey a fantasy for young people but then john's music raised the film to an art that would stand the test of time. And then Steven Spielberg also said, without John Williams, bikes don't fly, and neither do brooms in Quidditch matches, right. nor do men in red capes. There's no force, no dinosaurs walk the earth. We do not wonder, we do not weep, we do not believe. And I agree with these guys. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. All nice right. quote, Mark. Nice. Thank you. What's I made it all up myself. That's, that is a <laughs> big false. All right, what's next? <laughs> next up, well, we're still talking about John Williams, and this time it's from J.J. Abrams. He shared his thoughts on the legendary composer recently of the AFI Lifetime Achievement Award, and he said that he's got a couple favorites from his new score in The Force Awakens, one of which being Ray's theme. And it's also funny to go back to that because John Williams himself said that Part of the reason why he wants to come back to do episode eight is because he just doesn't want anybody else composing music for Daisy Ridley because he's just so enthralled with what she's able to bring to the screen. And then he also mentioned that, that cool resistance piece that John Williams mm -hmm. did is another standout. And as far as J.J. Abrams' all-time favorite John Williams score, he picked one that is up there for me as well, the binary sunset, the classic Luke That's looking off mm -hmm. into the distance. Yeah, I, I really like this uh, thing that JJ was talking about because you had mentioned Tiffany before with Ray. Ray's theme is one of my favorites mm -hmm. in the entire uh, Force Awakens, and I really like the Resistance theme and um, Kylo Ren. You know, just went dun, 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 dun. I remember thinking, yep. and, I, and I said it, and I'm guilty of saying when I first saw it. I, I might have said it to you, John, when I walked out. I was like, I was a little underwhelmed by the music. And then it just kept catching yep. me and catching me. And now when I watch it, like I was, there was, I was on StarWars.com yesterday, and I forget what video it was for, but the music came up, and I knew it instantly. I knew it instantly was from The Force Awakens, and I started to relate it. And I, I started to, I really enjoy that score. The more and more I listen to it, 
my favorite of all time, if I'm going in the Star Wars universe, either Yoda is 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 great, or Darth Vader and the you know the Emperors. I always like the Sith Lord stuff too. It's like you get it right away. Um, but overall, it's got to be either Superman or even Indiana Jones. Those are, those are the two the main themes that really stand out to me. How about you? Um, I thought what I loved about what JJ was saying was the fact that he was like, they were going in and recording stuff and I guess he played him some stuff and he was like, is this so, like John was just being like, is that okay? Like, how do you feel? The fact that this man has been doing this for so long and nailing it so many yep. times over and over again, still has doubts, still has those moments of where course. he's like, am I actually doing this right? Um, is this what you want? And I think that's what makes him so amazing that he keeps pushing himself. He keeps trying to do things a little bit differently and, you know, trusting the directors right. he's working with to have them really say, yes, this is what I want. This is the sound I'm looking for. Um, I think for me, and I said this when we saw The Force Awakens, that scene where you first hear Ray's theme and she's sliding down yep. the sand, yep. that moment, I was like, I got emotional and I didn't even know the character right. yet. Um, and it definitely brought me back to the binary sunset moment where it's like, I think those two, those two moments for me are the biggest standouts, which is when JJ says that I was like, yeah, it totally makes sense because it's the moment you're first really getting to know the character you're going to be following, whether it's in the first three films or now the force awakens going forward. Um, so I think that was the stuff that really stood out for me. And obviously Indiana Jones, I mean, it's like, I can't go to Disneyland and go on Indiana Jones and not like scream out the theme <laughs> with all my friends while we're running through, right. you know, it's just like, it's there in your head, which is crazy. Cause I don't really know many other composers where it's like that where people who aren't into like music from film know songs like that. Mark? I mean, Jaws is still just, I think it's just the greatest piece of music in movie history. And I love the Star Wars music. I love how when, as soon as you see the Star Wars opening crawl, it's just so loud and bombastic and in your face and you know you're on this great adventure, but Jaws is so simple and it's so mm -hmm. scary. You could hear that score and not see anything on screen and you know that there's an ominous presence looming and the way that score builds, it's just, it's very simple, but it gets the point across magnificently. So I love everything John Williams has done, but I think I'd go back, just that simple violin and Jaws. I love uh, that Spielberg said too with that, he was like, when he first played it, he was like, uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and then now it's, it's like- it's kind of on the nose and in your face, isn't yeah. it, with the Jaws? For me, it's, it's gonna be, a close second will be the Jurassic Park. Um, th yeah. There's there's something. Are you about taking Jaws first? No, you, no, you're no, taking, okay. no. Uh, I am not taking Jaws okay. first. Right. Uh, there's something about that 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 brings you because visually we see that scene when Sam takes the sunglasses off mm -hmm. and you get the visual sense of on wonder. That music catches the sense of on wonder. But and I hate to be cliche, but my number one is Imperial March. Yeah, yeah. Imperial mm -hmm. March. Yeah, of course, it's the Imperial yeah. March. It really is good. Um, let's see. I'm trying to. That didn't work out. I was going to play the Jaws theme. Okay, <laughs> what's next? I can just do it for you right no, here we're if good. you want. We're good. Okay, we're good. Then we'll move on to <laughs> our next story, which is the sound design for Rogue One. Friend of the show, IGN's own Max Nicholson, got to catch up with the sound designer for Rogue One, or at least whoever's supervising it. That would be none other than Matt Wood, who, by the way, works closely with his mentor, Ben Burt, on a lot of his projects. Yes. Ben Burt, if you have ever seen any of the DVD commentaries we did here at Collider for Star Wars, you will hear Mr. Campia singing the praises of Ben Burt very loudly so and very deservedly so. And Matt Wood, Nicholson asked this guy a lot of good questions because he's asking, and how do you blend the old and the new? How mm -hmm. do you tell a new story? And Wood is like, look, these sounds are iconic. And he makes a great point. There's so many sounds in Star Wars that you could have used in other movies, but they just are so synonymous with Star Wars that a TIE fighter screech would make sense in something like Transformers. But we know it ain't from Transformers. We know it's from Star Wars. And that when you're trying to make a new film and you have new ships and new designs, that you want to take some tinges of the old with it. It was a really fascinating read. What was your take, Christian? Yeah, same for me. And it just made me realize, though, that they they have a little bit more of a daunting task than even The Force Awakens did. Because The Force Awakens, you can get away with stuff like, well, oh, things have changed. It's been 30 years. This is right in the time that we know. So a lot of things have to kind of match up a little bit more. They can add new characters and, and new stormtroopers and stuff of that design because you can always say it's more extensive. The battles have gone on. But as far as the sounds go and as far as sound design, it's got to feel like that era. You got to you got to really feel like you're getting right into the lead up of episode four. So to hear, I mean, anytime, whether it's in the movies or like Rebels, I think Rebels got the sound design very well for Star Wars too. Like just the laser, the, the blasters, mm -hmm. the, the 
to just any any uh, uh, cruisers. The, the, the sound of the stormtroopers when they speak, like, the Tie Fighter is like my favorite sound. I like I love that screech of the Tie Fighter. They got it really. It was done very well in the Force Awakens. But yeah, hearing this and it gets me excited to feel like I'm back in because we haven't seen that era in Star Wars in a very long time on the big screen. Mm. We've seen it a lot in Rebels, we're reading a lot in comics. But to go back there now, right in that time period, which we all fell in love with Star Wars the first time, to hear the sounds. Yeah, I, I don't want new sounds. I want a lot of the old sounds with some new ones of new things that we didn't see before. But I, I really enjoyed this interview very much. Uh, I like that it brings attention to the sound design because I think we talk about visual effects often in action and, and the mythology, but sound design in the Star Wars films have always been incredible. I, I'll be honest with you, and I love The Force Awakens. Uh, the Force Awakens to me was probably the least best sound designed film out of all the Star Wars films. And you know, you heard me crap talking about the prequels already. The sound design in the prequels are unbelievable. Yeah. Like if you know anything about sound design, watch the pod racing scene and watch the special on the Blu-rays and on the DVD that they have about just sound designing that scene. The, the amount of care that went into that entire series of three films, the sound design and the visual effects, you can never besmirch what they did on those films with that. And I'm really glad that pieces like this draw attention to that. Too. Well, I, I feel like I talked about this a while ago on the show, but at the Warner Brothers lot tour, there was a section that they do sound design and they did it for, um, Gravity, mm -hmm. um, and I had no idea. Like you know that it obviously is a super important part of film, but seeing how much care, like you said, goes into it, and it's one of those things where it's like if anything is off a little bit, that's when you'll notice it. If it's on, you never notice it, and it seems like oh, that's just the way it's supposed to be. Right. Um, so I think hearing what he had to say about doing Rogue One, it's like. I almost started to think like, man, they've got a way more daunting task than even The Force Awakens did because of the fact that we're like, okay, Force Awakens was like re-entering the world. So exact same sounds, even though it's a different period, we're expecting the same stuff. This one, I feel like I'm going in and I'm like, even though I know the time period, I still want something different, but I don't want it to be too different, but I want it a little bit different. So I'm like, man, that is scary because all the fans I think feel that way where it's like, this is, if we're going darker, then do the sounds need to be a little bit darker? Do the new ships have to be a little bit more like aggressive, a little more daunting when they're coming in? I don't know. So I feel like for him having to come into this and saying that, the <laughs> yep, he's, he's just emailing <laughs> he just Christian. That, yeah. <laughs> um, but coming in and being able to say like, this is something I'm taking on and I'm going to do my best and make it my own, but at the same time still make it Star Wars. I'm like, that's a it's a lot to take on. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an underappreciated art form, particularly when you do have to bring some new things to the old classics yeah. that we all know and love. So whether you're an actor who has to now play Harrison Ford's Han Solo, but put your own spin on it, but still make us remember that's who that is, or you're like Colin Trevorrow and you have to direct Jurassic World and you got to bring back this beloved franchise and make us remember the original, but also add some new spins to it. Here, it's got a very tight window to fit in new effects mm -hmm. and 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 new new things that we haven't heard before because why haven't we heard them we've seen a movie that already takes place in this time period but there are going to be some new ships there's going to be a lot of new cool stuff in there and matt wood is going to bring a lot to rogue one it seems like all right what's next well i want to give a shout out to starwarsnewsnet.com that's where we get a lot of our stories they aggregate a lot of ones they get and they break their own scoops as well so thank you for that last but not least you know one of the most popular quotes from the force awakens was just a simple tell that to conja club you guys know it and i've had it beat into my face for the last <laughs> six months brian burnell the actor who played yeah, the member of the guavian oh, death he looks gang nothing like you there yeah is christian and i did this we have very similar eyebrows our yeah. forehead might be similar the eyes might be similar I look a lot like this guy. <laughs> or rather, this guy looks a lot like internationally famous comedian Mark Ellis. Yeah. He also talked about his experience on the set of Force Awakens and getting to work with a legend like Harrison Ford. It was actually a pretty cool interview, and I sound nothing like this guy. Christian? Uh, my favorite was that the, you know, the guys from Star Wars Newsnet actually sent this to me, and they let look at the comment section. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. The comment section was full of people that I go, wait. I legitimately thought that was Mark Ellis in the movie. Like these people, there were tons of people who actually thought Mark was in the movie. I'm looking like, at it right now on their website, and uh, it, 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 I, I thought people were joking. No, but, but there's they, actual there's people. Like, a lot of like, people actually thought you were in the movie. But it was nice to hear this kid because the thing that stood out exactly what you said, Mark, was you're this young kid. You look like Mark Ellis, and you go in, and you're seeing. <laughs> just throwing you all the wrong like, sorts of curves. He's like, what do I do with yeah. this face that I look so much like Mark Ellis? And, Am I going to get work? That's right. And your scenes are with Harrison. Except he's Ford. funny. 
Oh, oh. Whoa, wait. <laughs> and you're <laughs> not nice. And you go smoke your joints with the yeah, Optimus, Optimus Prime. Crack. Prime uh, you a crack. Yeah, crack. Sorry. So they, <laughs> just the, the fact that he got to work with Harrison Ford, his first scene, and it's a big scene to open up. It, it's it, it was it's really cool that they give these actors the shots. And I wonder how many times though he's gotten like text or emails like, hey. You know, you look like Mark Ellis. He's like, who, who the hell is Mark yeah. Ellis? If yeah, it's a tenth of the amount that he that I've gotten, then he's sure probably he sick of it by now. But you can follow tell him on Twitter. It's not me in the Force Awakens because that was me in Force Awakens. This guy is You'd still be crying to Han Solo. Me, yeah. I would be walking up like touching Chewbacca, telling like, jokes, trying to get an autograph. Like I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't have the wherewithal to try to tell no. a joke, man. This is Han Solo and Chewie we're talking yeah. about. I would be bowing down to their feet like Wayne and Garth mm. when they saw Alice Cooper. I would love to interview this guy, wouldn't you? I actually would. Yeah, I think great. Brian Vernon. I, I think the next time he's in the States, he'd be a great sport and he should yeah. come here and uh, we can go out and it'd be like the movie Twins. I uh, think, yeah, I think you guys need to like dress identically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can just both ask each other questions. <laughs> Tiffany, how do you feel you about Mark's tell. interview? Uh, I thought Mark's interview was great. Yeah. <laughs> Brian, Brian. Oh, Brian. How do you feel I about mean, Brian? Oh, God, I, I can't keep it straight. Um, I, I think the interesting thing is like, as a fan getting to come in and say, okay, that's the scene you're going to do. You're the one who has to like basically tell Han Solo that he's going to get killed like a death threat basically. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what? I have to do that. Like that's intimidating. And even like jokes aside, Mark, where you're saying, I'm sure on some level he walked into the set that day and was like, Oh my gosh, like yeah. this is what I'm about to do and I have to be intimidating. Like I can have no fandom in my eyes as I'm saying Solo. all of this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and it's a great scene. Like it's a very fun, I think that was one of the scenes that really initially brings you back to like, this is who the character of Han Solo is. He is a scoundrel. He does swindle people. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a moment where it's like, is he going to get caught? No, because he's Han Solo. He's not going to get caught. But there's that moment where you're like, maybe. So I thought the, inter the interview was cool. And it's, again, just exciting when you hear people that are fans of the property. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, it was really cool to get to be on set and shoot that moment. John? Brian was very good in the scene. I mean, yeah. like, like just the way he he committed to the scene. That the one, the, his best line, honestly, was that there's no one left in the universe for you to swindle. Right. You know, all that kind. Of, he played the scene great, but ultimately, I didn't care about the interview because that scene was the worst in the movie by far. Oh, that yeah. that is the one scene that you could have taken a scalpel to it, taken it out of the movie, and the movie would have been all the better for it. Uh, so it's tough for me to get emotionally invested in it when because he did great, and I feel bad saying that because he was really quite good in the scene. Well, I think like, they could have added. Just the whole more scene, to the that scene. And all that. I like I like the scene. I still am just not a huge fan of the the, yeah, the fact that they used yeah the fact that they used the CGI for that particular scene and it was so clear that it was for the Rascars. So I, I, I did maybe it's because like I'm the scene, in though. the scene, but I think that like, <laughs> I like the scene. I, 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 I thought like the, the scene. effects were great, and I thought that that was maybe the last time that you ever get to see Han Solo be that that smuggler that we all know that how we met him in A New Hope in 1977. I got that feel from him there, yeah. so I yeah. think that scene was crucial because yeah. it's not just Harrison. Ford coming back to put on a vest again. This is Han Solo. That scene, more than any other in the movie to me, announced that he was committed yeah. to playing this character yeah. again. All right, that's everything that's happening in Star Wars movie news. Now it is time to move on to what's the deal with canon? It <laughs> is. That was a weird one. Dude. I know. Okay. I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> what is the deal with canon? And this is everything that basically connects to the movies, comic books, games, books. TV shows, anything in the world of Star Wars that ultimately connects back to the episodes one through seven, we will, or Rogue One, we'll talk about them. Mark, what's up first? Well, E3 is in Los Angeles this week, and we're not there because we love you guys so much. Was it cool, was, Tiff? Yeah, it was awesome. There was so much virtual reality, oh, but wow. it was epic. It was awesome. Ah, well, that might play into yep. this story mm -hmm. because Star Wars obviously made a huge presence. They have a ton of video games in the work, and their presentations largely focused on all the new titles that are coming out. More importantly than that, there were two notable updates, one of which was that Electronic Arts gave kind of a catch-all look to what they have coming up in the Star Wars video game universe. And then we also got to see something that just looks amazing, which is the virtual reality uh, Battlefront X-Wing game, where you are you feel like you're in an X-Wing. And they released a trailer of this and how it might look when you're playing the game. 
I felt like I was Wedge Antilles just watching this trailer. Yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff to look forward to. Now, occasionally, I bring up video game stories, and not being a huge gamer myself, I present them to the council, and they act like, oh, yeah, it's just another Star Wars game. What do you guys think of these, though? Well, this was the, what you're referring to is when we were talking about E3 last time, and they said this is the stuff that they're going to announce, and we're all like, well, it doesn't seem like there's going to be anything new, so we're not that excited. That's not what happened. That's mm -hmm. actually different. Well, like, very different thing, too. EA was not actually at E3. They had their own separate thing, which right. I think was very interesting because mm -hmm. it's very similar to, you know, what Star Wars Celebration does, where it's like, we've got enough stuff. Let's do our own thing. And it was and that's yeah, where so they, that's a mixture where they of lots of this, this, this was like a mixture of all that stuff yeah. that kind of came about. And this image, though, I didn't know that this particular game here, and this is the Visceral one. Is that uh -huh. what it is? Yeah. This, I didn't know. Nobody knew a time In -game period. game play. It's clearly... It's clearly after the events of episode six because we didn't know wh where it was coming from. We thought maybe it was going to be- First Order. Yeah, you see First Order right there. We don't know who that guy is, but we're going to learn more about that time period. And it is, and they, in that video, if you didn't watch that video, um, where they did this big presentation of all the different games that they're coming out with, with this one, it's just the, the emphasis on story. Mm -hmm. They're very aware that fans want story for Star Wars because there was a big emphasis on it in this game. But also, even with Battlefront, I think there's also a realization that they want to do more with it and the fans didn't, all the fans, they didn't get the response from the fans that they wanted and they're going to do improvements, whether it's through the virtual reality and other things too. So I like this overall video that I saw and, it, and they're still focusing on the Old Republic, which is still to me always like a, it's a bit of a tease because it's like, even though I know I'm going to love playing and I love that era, but I, it's still, it's the one weird thing because it's like John says, God bless you over there. Um, it's, it's one of these things to where it's multiple layers of canon. It's like mm. what it, just tell me Old Republic's canon. Stop making games for it. Stop doing additions to it. Make it canon. It's like, it, you, it, tell me that it's a thousand years before episode four, and that's now where the Old Republic is. Stop teasing me with these games because it, it's 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 hard to do. Then if you're going to do that, then why not go back to what we're talking about? Timothy's on, and then just decide you want to make a different book, uh, not not can nor that's <laughs> legends or that's legends or that's legends. So why why are you continuing making legends games because you know you have the right IP for it and it's a lot of fun? Just make it canon. But John, what do you think? Um, well, I mean, earlier this week, some videos got came out that came originated through that every one of the sub companies, I think, of EA is working on their own Star Wars game right now. Yeah. And if you look it up on YouTube, you can find the video. And I, look, I was underwhelmed with Battlefront. But I'm excited. Yeah. They, a lot they of cool just, stuff. Just not just the, the stuff they were showing, but hearing the game makers talking about their philosophies going into it, it made me go. I'm kind of itching to see what we can get our hands on as far as new Star Wars games go. Mm -hmm. Well, because you know something, even if even if they're so they're gonna make ten games, I'm gonna guess that at least one of them is going to be great. Hope so. At least one, and that to me is enough. As long as I can keep getting them and trying them, because this is never. I think we can all agree on this. Even Battlefront, this is not from a lack of trying or them cheaping out. It just, it just didn't work. No, no, not at all. Absolutely. Every game that they put out and that they're going to continue to put out is going to have all the heart and effort that it, that The Force Awakens did or all these other, like, they understand and know what they're working with. Every game maker, every single artist, everyone working on this is going to put love and heart. So even if it doesn't work, I'm going to get every single one of them to mm -hmm. try out and tell me the story of what comes next. I also think when Battlefront first came out, it was at a weird stage because of the fact that they couldn't really tell us much. They couldn't really build that much into it. It was really just about getting you excited about being a part of this world again. And so it, the VR makes complete sense for me to go with Battlefront because that was the highlight of that game is that you feel like you are in the battle, you get to fly an X-Wing. And so adding VR to that, right. yes, totally on board. Um, what I love that video that they did was basically like did that, that commercial that came out that was like the guy in his office. Yeah, and Anna then, Kendrick. Yeah. Awesome. yeah, yeah. What? Anna Kendrick was in the Battlefront one too. Oh, you no, 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 you know, R two D two on his desk, yeah. and, and and yeah, and the, the two, two sons, sons are yeah. in the window, and so it's like it felt very nostalgic, even going into the video to explain what they wanted to do with the games moving forward. Um, the visceral game, obviously, hearing Amy Henning talk about anything, I'm so excited about her being on board on this project. We talked about it last week about her hiring a bunch of new people to come in and really help to flesh the game out even more. Um, what I think they're doing such a good job with is the fact that they are hitting every level of gameplay, where it's like I think it's the 
heroes of the galaxy or yeah, galaxy yeah. something where it's mm-hmm. like it's not necessarily going to be canon but it's like there are fights in there that we only imagine where it's like oh man i want to see this person go up against this person and you get to do that in that game um the cool thing is that it's kind of working you know doing stuff with g4 and being a part of x play and kind of knowing some more of the game developers it's like you start to hear rumblings you start to hear things here and there and i'm like even when you know old republic came out i happened to know somebody who did some of the motion capture for it and it was like wait you're doing old republic like, what so right. every time i see the twins i'm like oh, i know that twin right <laughs> um, so it is really cool and i think that they're moving in a great direction and i think that it really has to do with the fact that the movies are coming out now. So they have a little bit more breathing room and they can ingest or not ingest, infuse a lot more um, of the actual it, yeah. story. They can infuse it and we can ingest yeah. it. But we do have the movies coming out now. And so, you know, before Mickey Mouse got his bank account involved in Star Wars, then that's really all we had. We could read the books and we could explore the video games and the war that they were telling. So one of my favorite pastimes for a good 10 or 15 years was either to play a Star Wars video game or to watch the trailer for a Star Wars video game and be like, why don't they make this a movie? And now we get a movie. We're going to get at least one every year for the foreseeable future. So when I see these teasers, it makes me very excited. But at the same time, I just don't have the time or the energy to invest in really playing all of these video games. There's so much content coming out. It is a spoil of riches. As somebody whose game that they only really play anymore is Tetris, I still, that virtual reality being oh, yeah. the X-Wing, that looked pretty damn yeah. awesome. All right, what's next? Uh, Let's go over to comic books. Star Wars issue number 20 is new on the shelves. And we happen to have somebody who is not only literate, but he can look at pictures and read at the same time. (laughs) We go to Christian Harloff with the latest. These are my favorite Star Wars issues. It goes back to the way I was able to convince John that an Obi-Wan Kenobi standalone would be good because of these issues, man. It's all about Obi-Wan and young Luke. And there's that that bounty hunter Wookiee is after... um, after Owen, he got, he grabs Owen, and they kind of they're looking for whether it be Luke. They're trying to figure out some stuff, and Obi Wan now gets into a battle with this thing. But you see, he's trying to fight against using the Force. Owen calls him Ben. Luke is great as he's trying to kind of run away from from home. He's looking for an adventure, but it, but he still you see the relationship and why he stays with his family. There's a lot of cool stuff going on in this stuff. It just made me realize I want to see more of this. I want to see the relationship of Ben and Luke back then because they don't interact that much, but it's just always the watchful eye, always looking. And the artwork is incredible in this particular issue. I love what's happening with the development of Luke in this overall run of Star Wars because he kind of flashes back to this stuff and calls back to it in the the later or the earlier issues and just what Obi-Wan was doing. We always wanted to know kind of what he was doing. This is a little bit of an insight, but I also think this is them saying, what do you guys think? Huh? Is this something you guys care about? And, uh, and I do. I really do. And they've done it like three or four different times now with him. And to me, it's been the most intriguing stuff. So the second I knew and Riley walked in and saw it, he's like, wait, wait. He started asking questions like this is about so that's young Luke and that's that's oh this is awesome like he didn't even know what was happening and then once he did he just he couldn't leave my desk just looking at it because I think it's a fascinating story and the artwork's great so if you aren't reading Star Wars in general this might be a good one to start especially if you love Obi Wan Kenobi well Riley should give you your personal space yes, and more importantly <laughs> I have two questions so yeah. one before the Wookiee attack Ben did he say don't make me angry you wouldn't like me when I'm angry no it would have been nice he's though. hulking out he looks yeah. like Lou Ferrigno right yeah. there the other question is what is the Wookiee doing What? what is the, wh- who sent this Wookiee to go attack this poor old hermit who may or may not be a Jedi I don't want to spoil it okay yeah you should check it out but, according uh, to the graphic Jabba Thanks a lot, Ray. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I Jabba. also like the fact that on the cover he's got the crossbow that yeah. Chewie has in The yes. Force Awakens. It's a different one. Um, okay, so what's next? He's got that little chastity belt, too. Nice look for the Wookiee. Uh, we go to Han Solo. Gotta protect the business. Issue number one. And uh, speaking of Wookiees, Han and Chewie hanging out on the cover of this brand new comic series. How was the debut? This is my favorite debut out of any Star Wars Stop comic. It. Really? Yes, it is. It don't spoil it. I haven't I'm read not. it yet. It nails Han Solo. It takes place right after the Battle of Yavin. He's kind of on his own doing his thing. Even Chewie and him have kind of taking a little bit, a very brief break. But then 
as Han always does, he gets sucked back into it. It also plays into the racing element, which we learn a lot more in Bloodline right. that happens. Mm -hmm. We also learned about the, you know, obviously the Parsec story that we've heard a million times over doesn't necessarily play itself, but you know that he's always been in tune with racing. He's always been, and you, there's a little bit more of that. And the relationship between him and Leia is just on point. I, I couldn't stop reading this issue. I wanted more of it. It was, and obviously there's a reason why. And, and the other thing that I noticed was there's a, the, the artwork definitely looks like Harrison Ford, but there's a couple times when I said like, are they trying to shade his face to make him look like a, someone else? Like maybe a newer actor? I don't know. It was, it was interesting, but I highly recommend this one, especially if you're a Han Solo fan. If you're not a Han Solo fan, you're probably not a Star Wars fan. But if you, if you wanted to start reading a comic from the beginning, this is the one to get. It's fantastic. Loved this issue. Okay, what's next? Uh, well, there's a game that's creating a lot of buzz at E3 right now, and it's called God of War. Thank God it is not based on Gods of Egypt, the crappy movie that came out earlier this year. <laughs> it changed its course from being Greek mythology, and now it's Norse. But God of War has a very interesting origin story, and yes, there's a reason why we're talking about it here on Jedi Council, is that a lot of the inspiration for this game came from scripts for the Star Wars live-action television show that was being worked on by George Lucas in the early to mid-2000s. Yes, we always heard rumblings that maybe George Lucas wanted to do a TV series in the Star Wars universe. There were finished scripts for that, and when the God of War creative director Corey Barlog was able to actually check out some of those scripts, a lot of the inspiration for this game came from that, particularly when it comes to a guy named Emperor Palpatine. Christian, this blew my mind. How <laughs> yeah. about you? Loved it. Now, have you ever played the God of War games? I have not. The God of War games they're were awesome. very good. They are great. This is either what the third or fourth one now that they're working on. I, can't I lost count. Third or fourth. Two. I loved these games, um, but I loved this story even more. This is really cool because I knew nothing about the live action series. All I knew was that it was going to take place in the underworld. There was rumors that there would you get some classic characters, mm -hmm. but this obviously confirms that with Palpatine, and it also kind of throws me back into James Lucino's novel of Darth Plagueis. Now there wasn't there there wasn't this relationship that they're talking about here, but it just it there was more to Palpatine. You learn more about him of the family that he came from and what he did, what he did. I like that they were going to explore that more. That's more of the story for me is I wonder if they're ever going to explore that period and him and if you're going to learn more about the emperor because I liked that this is why I think a Star Wars TV series to me again would work because you get to explore these things in longer issues, excuse me, longer episodes and and just more classic characters that you can explore more to. You can get it can be dangerous times with that. We're just like you said, John. You don't want to. Well, I don't need to know where Boba Fett went to high school. Agreed. But something like this with Palpatine, like that he was like basically involved with like a female gangster and she just kind of chewed him up and spit him out. To me, that's what always happens with a Sith Lord. There's something in their lives that sends them down even more. Like they, they're just a shallow, they're just kind of fragile. And then they start to go down a certain path, a dark path, because of an, something that happens. This to me made sense. I thought it was fascinating. I thought it was, well, one, it's really interesting because Underworld was actually on IMDb. Like the, sh then I don't know when they initially came out, but the mm -hmm. whole breakdown for it was on IMDb that the show was gonna happen. Um, the interesting part to me is, are you allowed to come out and be like, yeah, I totally took stories from there and I'm not putting it in my video game. <laughs> I, I mean, there I must guess have been they some must level have of permission said, around there. Yeah, there where be. it's like something had to happen because then it, that's the bummer part of it is that if that is the case and they it. could take right. stuff from it, that means we're not going to see that story. Um, but I definitely think for people who maybe are only getting into gaming because of Star Wars, this would be a good gateway for them to be like, oh, you can play God of War and kind of get a little bit of a perspective on where George wanted to go and explain stuff about the Emperor and get a little more backstory on there without necessarily having it be too much in detail. Um, I agree with you though on the Sith Lord stuff where it is there always is something that sets them off in that path that's kind of the trigger for everything to go down that dark path. Um, so it would have been interesting to get to see that. I still do think that we're gonna get a TV series at some point. I still 
stand by the fact that I would rather it not be about characters that are so closely tied to the film. I would rather see some like underworld characters, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but some characters that we don't know quite as well so they can play and have a little bit more freedom with those characters. Uh, I love it though that, you know, somebody who was working on such an awesome game was a part of Lucasfilm and was like, hey, this was a great story. It was really intriguing. And I think if anything too, it gives more credit to what George still has the story ideas that he still has the creative ideas that are coming out of him where it's like this other guy was working on something totally different he's like those stories were incredible and impacted me how can i use that how can i work with that in this new kind of storytelling genre john uh look i i'm on record i don't want them to do a star wars tv show i don't think they should but that being said i am you're I gonna be, watch it if of there course is I would. Yeah, right. <laughs> but but the key to good health is not getting everything you want right. <laughs> like there's lots of things that i want that i would totally consume if you put it ask in front optimus of me prime. Not ne- yes ask yeah. optimus, not necessarily good for me i and I, I just think a tv show nothing would be more perilous for the long-term health of the star wars brand than a TV show. I mean, look, comic book movies and Star Wars are two different things. Comic books and the studios know this. It is an ebb and, and tide. I mean, it will it'll rise a crest of popularity. It will lose popularity. Mm-hmm. It is a trend. It will come and it will go. Like I, It's nowhere near ending anytime soon. But five, six, seven years from now, the comic book thing is gonna go dry. So now's a good time to jump in there, get these TV shows going, because that's why the iron's hot. Disney looks at Star Wars differently. They want to ride this for generations, and they can if they play it right. And I just think a TV show is, if you want the fastest path to watering something down, start putting out lots of different things, and I think a TV show is the wrong move. That being said, man, you put those scripts of the old Underworld stuff in front of me, I would devour those up, man. I'd be very, very curious to see what they were planning for that. And it's kind of cool that it's making its way, some of the elements at least, into a video game. But do you think that, like, like, I don't think Daredevil and Jessica Jones or what they're going to do with Luke Cage, any of that is watering down the Marvel world. If no, anything, no. What he's saying, what he's saying, is that like in six years when it does, they're capitalizing on it now. So all the stuff that they're putting out right now makes it, sense. It makes sense because it's yeah. hot and the topics are hot because the long game for them is eventually this thing's going to go away. As where Disney, from what John's saying, is that Disney wants With Lucas. well yeah, Star we Wars. Want they want it to just carry every on year forever. For yeah. the next- 50 years. So if they followed Marvel, Marvel's plan right now, doing the same even thing, even building their theme parks around it now, yeah. like they are so invested in this brand. Right. I don't, yeah. I don't agree. I don't agree with what you're saying. Most but people I, don't. But I, to- but I totally understand your point. Yeah, yeah. I think Mark. it's true. Beanie Babies are a lot easier to get today than they were at the peak of their popularity in the <laughs> late nineties. What are you 90s. saying? The, uh, Beanie Babies, Pokemon, Sokomiyamo, these are things that are huge in the moment, and then they're more available, and we don't care about them as much. The risk with Star Wars is exactly what John said is as much as I love this stuff and I love absorbing the content when you put so much out first of all it leaves me with little time to have a social life and also I think that the big huge releases of the films which is why I love Star Wars and still my favorite thing about that galaxy it loses a little bit of luster when we have so much content that oh yeah now we're gonna go see Rogue One then we're gonna get excited for episode 8 I enjoy my downtime I enjoy getting revved up to experience something new in the Star Wars universe which is why I think even one movie a year is that's a pretty tight window to let me see something get excited about it and celebrate it and then relax and then get amped up for something new I don't hate the idea of a TV show I think it could work if you did Underworld on Netflix you did something like that great it's just nothing that I'm waiting for it's nothing that i'm like man i am so hungry for new star wars content if i want that i can go start playing a video game or i can start reading a comic book or a novel and i haven't done that yet so i love the fact (laughs) that we do have to wait a little bit i think it's awesome and just to clarify games beat is who was interviewing barlog for this story and he said that this was the germination of the idea is when he briefly worked at lucas arts he was able to check these out Mm -hmm. and that's where he started to plant the seed but i mean by no means is he taking scenes from what he read from the Star Wars script and transferring that directly in to Gods of War. That's its own thing. All right, so that's everything in the world of canon. Now it's time to hear from you guys. We ask you every week to make sure you tweet out hashtag Collider Jedi Council. We go through and we pick them out. Mark, what are they saying on the twits? Chris Cook says, what do y'all think of this new theory? Ray is Darth Sidious's granddaughter. <gasps> Mind blown, Christian Harloff. Um, uh, I mean, it's a theory that's been going around. I, 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 it's I not new. No, it's not <laughs> new. It's been going around for a little bit that she's somehow related to Sidious, uh, a.k.a. Palpatine. And we just talked about, you know, 
this this storyline here that maybe it's floating around Lucas that Palpatine did have a relationship somehow and there was a family that happened and would I would I be angry if it happened no but I don't I'm not like hoping for it I and I and I'll tell you this I don't think I've said it on the air I'm starting to I I really am going away from my theory that uh Ray is is Luke's kid Oh, I'm going well, away from what? it. I'm going away from it. Um, you did make a good point. That, look, look, Sheev, for whatever you want to say about how he looked in Return of the Jedi, that's not his best day, okay? <laughs> Back in his prime, Sheev probably got a land. He laid with more than one lady. Yeah. Oh, my God. Even when he was the emperor, who knows what he was, that he creep was doing. He might have We yeah. don't know. And what have I Have you love, seen the ladies Keith Richards gets? Right. Dude, yeah. Yeah. This is the emperor not? we're talking Power. about. Yeah. Yeah, he power just plays band. guitar in a blues band. This guy has a power that can be used for a lot of dark forces. Right. Much less, hey, can I buy you another drink? Are you sure? Right. Like, it could work <laughs> if he wants it to. Right. I just, just love saying. the creepy eyes that you just Are did. You can sure? I buy you another drink? <laughs> Are you sure? But, but the other thing is, and I think that, that maybe, I think I, I had this thought early on, and I'm not bragging because I'm rarely right in life, but when you see the, the lightsaber face that Daisy Ridley has as Ray sometimes, and you see the face that Palpatine has uh, with, with that sword, it's like, yeah, but you can say the same thing. There's, they, they, there was a side by side with when Luke did it when she's got yeah. the. No, they, they, they've done side by side yeah. with I've Luke. I've heard crazier yeah. theories. I know, like John. That. Look, it. In one sense, it's one of the theories that look. There are several theories that you could put in this place that would fit. There are several pieces that could fit in this empty spot, and this Palpatine one is one of them. Because think about this, you know, if she is a granddaughter of Palpatine. Once again, the universe is not used to lineage when it comes to Jedi. Force doesn't run in families, right. per se, until this new thing as we come into this era of Star Wars with the Skywalkers or whatever. Luke would know that she could potentially be incredibly powerful. And he understands, hey, I was the son of a Sith Lord. And so he might have an emotional connection to that. Mm -hmm. He brings Ooh. her in to train her and then realizes when he starts smelling something might be going wrong here, he sends her off into hiding. That fits the theory. Damn. Part of me just thinks a little bit about, when I think about Palpatine though, having grandkids, I think of him as the Sheriff of Nottingham in that Robin Hood. Yeah. <laughs> he's just yeah, he's walking the cantina, you, my room, yeah. eight o'clock, you, right. eight thirty, and right. bring a friend. Who you know? told you to cover up? Who Get, told you yeah. to cover Get up? Get out of the closet, Vader. I, I mean, so, I, it, so if it, do I think that's what they're doing? No, I, I don't think that's a theory, but if that turns out, it does completely fit the circumstances they've set up for us. Yeah. I think uh, John's idea is intriguing and if that's where they went i wouldn't be upset about it i think the comparisons when you're saying oh this person makes a similar face or has a similar fighting style there is some of that where it's like if they really are going that direction i'm sure they talked with the actors about like okay this is the we're gonna have you do this specific stuff but on the flip side of it is the fact that this is star wars is so permeated pop culture that if you went into audition for something how much do you think you watch that stuff to see the faces that they made while yeah. they were using their lightsaber? So it's like, is that something that's just so ingrained in our brain that that's where it's like, those are the kind of looks you're gonna have when you're fighting with a lightsaber. Um, I, again, I, I, I'm much more intrigued by the idea that she's not related to anyone that we know yet. I would really like it to be someone totally new and we could bring in you know, just a new storyline to it because of the fact that we already know that Kylo is related to characters that we know. Right. For her, it could be really interesting. I mean, and it could be obviously that it's Sidious and then another character that we have not met yet. So I, I don't know, I'm just leaning more towards the, I really like the fact that we could potentially have parents her parentage be characters that we have not even experienced can in we, Star Wars Can we world do yet. The, uh, the percentage game? Can on this one, on, on the Palpatine one? I'm thinking, because of what John just said. Go ahead. He lent some credibility so to it. Yes. My favorite number is 22. I'm going to go one below it. 21% chance. Okay. That she is. related she, to Palpatine? Yeah. Okay. I'll go 25. Yeah. I'll go higher. I'm going to go 32%. Wow. wow. Five. <laughs> um, all right. All right. What's next? Are Taking you? us back down to Earth. Derek Richardson says, do you think the next animated series will be set in the Old Republic? Less story restrictions that Rebels and Clone Wars had. No. Mm -hmm. There has been rumblings no. for a very long time that once Rebels ends, that a series is going to take place kind of gapping in between episode six up until episode seven. I think that is absolutely going to be the case. Now, where exactly, whether it's five years, 10 years, 15 years, who knows? Maybe it's it's a, a mixture of all those things. But I think that is what they need to do. They got to get out of the 
way of the episode in between four and five mm-hmm. and in between five and six and even over public stuff i think is it's going to be a tough one to tackle either theatrically or uh, in an anima- so animation animation is something that you could possibly do in old republic so i don't think it's crazy i just don't think it's going to be the next one i think the focus is going to be more on the on the stories that they're telling in the movies right now and i think a lot of that like they're doing in bloodline and aftermath tying in all those gaps and the comics with uh, shattered empire they're going to tie in the gaps with the new animated series john what do you think then you you settled it i mean they've pretty much already laid out when the next one's going to happen so that kind of settles the question yeah. I think it would be it's smarter to take that time period where it's characters that you're meeting within the films that other people may be like, oh, now we're moving forward. But I want to know more about these characters that I love. And that's going to draw them into watching a series more. I feel like the people who've been fans of Star Wars for a really long time obviously want to see more of the in-between stuff to fill in those blanks. But I feel like it's necessary for them to do an animated series that connects with characters that are now moving forward in the Star Wars universe. Episode one, Poe Dameron's parents getting it on on the indoor party. That's what I want to say. Right after that, yeah. It's like right after, right? Right near the forest tree. Okay, what's next? Uh, Craig writes, what's the checklist of things you want to see in Rogue One? For me, it's simply Vader dominating on the battlefield. I'm going to take one of yours. It's definitely Vader on the battlefield, but show me Alderaan. I know we've seen Alderaan at the end of episode three, I think a little bit of Rebels, but show me a little bit more about it. Show me the, how beautiful it is. Show me, uh, I'd love to see Jimmy Smith's pop in there. I haven't heard any rumors of him whatsoever, so I, I just don't think it's going to happen, but I'd like to see Alderaan, and, and I know we're going to get it, but just really tying into episode four. Um, I just want to see really good introductions to these characters that we haven't met yet. I I feel like they did such a great job in The Force Awakens giving us small snippets of these people's lives, but there's so many characters that we're meeting in this movie just based off of the team that they've put together that I just want them to nail the intros for all of them. Um, And then obviously, minor three. That, the intros, and like small scenes between them, the stuff with Vader, and I want to see Alderaan too. Because I feel like that's the only time that we're going to get to do that, and it's going to have an impact that will make me feel that much more connected to the series moving forward. Mark? I want to see uh, a few things. I, I want to see Darth Vader in his prime. Absolutely. I want to see him wearing Yvonne Drago's shorts. I want to see this guy <laughs> when he was the baddest man in the galaxy. I also would kind of like to see Emperor Palpatine. I want to see a little bit of Palpatine in there after this most recent story. Maybe he just puts his arm around Jen or so and they go to the drive. <laughs> we just don't know. But uh, like, whatever, w- whatever story this one's telling me, whatever characters, I'd also like to see Donnie Yen beat up like 10 stormtroopers with a oh, stick. Yeah. Get that, that would be sweet. I, yeah. like, that is my, one of my biggest fears. I'm like, if you're going to put Donnie Yen in it, have him actually use the things that he can do because the actors that they brought in from the, the raid, raid? Yeah. they yeah. didn't use them at all. Right. And it's so disappointing because they're so ridiculously talented. I can't believe that. I mean, we all, I, we I all speculated they were going to be Knights like, of Ren. Why would you yeah. bring in those guys? I just have them go, oh! Yeah, you could have anybody It was great creature. publicity. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. good. Actually, it got us talking in the news yeah. cycles. Sure. The only, look, I've got, a ch- I got a bunch of things I'd like to see. I mean, yeah, I'd like to see some great epic war scenes. I want to see a lot of Donnie Yen. I want to see... The, but really, if you're going to talk check like check boxes, I only got really one. The one is Vader. I, I want to see a good amount of Vader. And then other than that, I come with no other check boxes. I'm just ready to come in that theater, sit down, and take in what you're serving. Because I'm, I'm looking forward to it. But it'd be cool to see Alderaan. Oh, it would, look, <laughs> I, it, not, not only would it be cool, it would fit, it would make yeah. sense. It yeah. would almost feel out of place if it's if Alderaan is not in there, when you understand the role of Alderaan right. in the beginning of the, of the rebellion. But really, I am just so excited for this movie. I'm just ready to take what you're given. Yep. And yep. no pre-expectations from me. All right, what's next? Uh, next up is Ty Streets writes, could the issues with Rogue One cause future spinoffs to be focused on a single character like Han or a Kenobi, etc.? It's a good question. Um, l- let's also, let's say that if these rumors are true that's that's the question on the table if these rumors are true will they at least for the next few movies focus on spin uh, just single character spin-offs i do think that that might happen because it's just it's one particular character that they know works whether it is a i think they get a little scared if it is, if if it actually affects the movie and actually affects the box office i think that they're going to try to go with a sure thing whether it's a han solo a boba fett you know a, a luke standalone movie an obi-wan whatever it is that way they know they have kind of a sure thing in their characters but i also don't really buy into many of the rumors so they'll 
you know, some things are happening, but I still think it's going to turn out to be a great movie. I mean, I think it's like I always hate, not hate, but the comparisons of Marvel versus Star Wars, but where it's like Guardians of the Galaxy, people were nervous about that one because it's like, well, these are all characters that we don't know. And we've got to introduce them to everyone. And what if people don't connect with them? It's a talking tree and a talking raccoon. Like they have way less to deal with with this whole team bringing in new characters. Um, so I'm hoping that that's not something that people are worried about, that it's a team instead of it being based off of one character in particular. To me, I mean, I don't want to see that happen. I don't want to see every spinoff have to be focused on one particular character. Some of them, absolutely. Han Solo, into it. I would much rather it be stories that we're getting into instead of it being, we're going to tell this character story or this character story or this character story. Because it's even when you look at the books and the novelizations of things that are coming out, it's not necessarily saying we're going to tell this one person's story in the book. It's a time period. It's a story that involves multiple characters. And I think that's what's so intriguing about it. Because even Star Wars or The Force Awakens, it's like Daisy Ridley is maybe the lead character, but really you're getting, you know, Finn's story and Poe's story and Kylo Ren's story. And so it isn't necessarily just a one character story arc. Um, so I hope that that's not where it leads. I'm still, I, I don't think that Rogue One is going to be any bad film in any way. I don't think it's going to yeah, flop. I, I think that it's going to be a success. So I don't think it's something we really need to worry about. Well, okay. So let's start with the beginning of the question. Could the issues with Rogue One, until we see Rogue One, we don't know what the issues are or if there are any issues at all to begin with. Secondly, unless the movie's called Castaway or Buried, no movie has one actor who's your focal point and no other actors around them. <laughs> like even look, the Captain America movie, he's surrounded by characters. The Thor movie, surrounded by characters. But they're not selling the movie on one no, character. No, absolutely. In this but one. And I think even in Rogue One, I think we're going to find out that our girl who rebels uh, is is really really more of the, the a key central figure yeah. in the sense that this may not be marketed as her film but i i got a feeling by the end of it we're going to see this was her film so I, I don't think whether the attention is on an ensemble or the attention is on a single character will have anything to do with it whatsoever in any way. And besides, they've already got a couple of things. We already know we got a Han Solo movie coming. We already know that we got some others coming down the, the line. But whether it's an ensemble or an individual, it's still all a big cast of actors playing a big cast of characters either way. It's just a matter of where their story emphasizes. I don't think it's gonna change one thing. See, now I can't get the image of Darth Vader as Tom Hanks' character in Castaway <laughs> out of my head. Well, son! Yeah, yeah. Like Darth Vader just walking, trying to start a fire, like, oh, this is really hard. Like, <laughs> no. I actually think that people gotta, gotta remember that Rogue One has a tough job, a lot of tough jobs, one of which is being connecting to a story that we are already in love with. So I think there's just as big of a chance that Rogue One might actually actually cause them to want to do stories further away from the lore that we already know because if it's too closely connected or doesn't sync up exactly right we may just want to see something entirely new we may not want to just see all the other characters eventually we're going to get we're going to want to get new stories and that could kick off with rogue one if it gets a little too close to what we already know all right uh, all right what's next uh next up we have ben wilson and he writes, how do you feel about Robert Fetsworth III appearing in Rebels? I think that it's going to happen. I think it should happen. And I think even if you did it kind of just like a very side kind of issue, similar, not, not he, was a, he was a different age during Clone Wars. But I think let's introduce him a little bit in, in Rebels. I think it makes sense. How old sense. is he going to be? He's going to be not like a... No, teens, 20s? no, no, in Rebels. I mean, remember, Rebels is only it's like 25. At this point, yeah. it's only about three years before episode four, and we're close yeah. to that. Yeah. You know, who knows okay. how close we're getting to Rogue One, so it's, it's not too far he's off. Doing, he's, he's got a few gigs already. Yeah. He's a bounty hunter. Yeah. Sean? I misread the question first because I thought it was like uh, Boba Fett appearing in Rogue One. I'm like, uh, no, that yeah. is shrinking yeah. the universe. Nerd. Rebels, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thumbs up. I think they've done such a good job with bringing characters in, like even the small stuff with Lando and even Leia coming in. Absolutely, I want to see it. And I think they do a great job with it. Mark? I want to hear if they pronounce it Boba or Baba. Please be Baba. <laughs> it will not be Baba. All right, what's next? Angelo Sarantino writes, could Laura Dern be playing Carice Sindian from Bloodline in episode eight? Christian, you read that book. I certainly hope so. And I think that it could be a great way to tie it in because remember, Ryan Johnson helped work on this novel. So maybe, mm. maybe, I, I'm, if we're going to do percentages here, I'm going to go as high as, say, 45% that she is going to play that character. Um, Mark, someone who has definitely not read this book, what do you think? 
I think that Carice Sindian, uh, well, I, let me ask you a question. Did she ever spend any time, whether working in an official capacity or spring breaking, on Harloff Minor? <laughs> she did not, no. Okay. She did not. I think she's going to be in the movie then. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, less than 1%. Less than 1%. Uh, one of the things I think you're, misrem- you're not remembering quite correctly is that uh, Lady at the time, yeah. uh, Carice, uh, she was younger. That's I, yeah, as she I was, was sitting younger. here. I'm she trying was, to think she was about closer age. to Gustavo's age um, in the movie than she was is to Lady's age. Yeah. That much? Really? yeah, but that's okay. like five years before Force Awakens, right? Mm, a little bit less. And so this isn't that. So now you're no, talking about eight years. Only like it's six years before the Force Awakens. Okay, so yeah. now you're maybe separating seven or eight years. Yeah, I, I think Laura, Laura Dern's, Dern's a little like old, old yeah. for, for maybe, that. Maybe I'm super right. excited about Laura Dern, but I don't think she's going to be the former Lady Carice. When the question came up, I was like, but I feel what time period are we in? Because I, too, was like, she's younger in the books than Leia is. Um, I think it would be cool if that character did show up, but I don't think it's going to be her. All right, two more. Two more. Nyla is next up, and she writes, where do you think Ahsoka will show up after what happened to her on Rebels? Well, who knows, man? I mean, first of all, I don't even know if she's alive. Um, we, well, we know she's alive. We saw her walking away. Nope. That's what I thought. Yeah. And then after speaking to both Ashley and yeah. speaking to Freddie. I don't care Freddy, what they said. I know what I saw. I uh, saw her Yeah, but, you don't, that's, but why you don't, would her, that's the whole why point. That's she what they a, said. Yeah. You don't know yeah. what, you th- you, what you saw. Filoni it's loves a, this character too much. If, they, if she was going to die, and I wish they had given this to her. You would have given you her give a little her more. give her trumpets blowing, yeah. blazes of glory, a glorious, heroic final end, and they did not give that to her. There's no way F- uh, Filoni... So you think her. she's definitely alive? She's definitely alive. And she'll she's definitely come up. back. Okay. And I, I think that's the wrong move. They should have given her. She deserved... Uh, she's won me over yeah. this season of Rebels. She won me over, and I got on the board. It's like, you know what? This character now deserves that blaze of glory end. Right. And I thought that was the place and time to do it, and they didn't give it to her. And so I, I can only hope that Filoni's got grand, plans. wonderful plans for her later on to justify not giving her that great, glorious end. I 100% think she's coming back in Rebels, but I think that Fourth talking... Coast? No, not necessarily like that, but hearing him talk about Gandalf, and mm. when you talk about not having a glorious death, it's like, Gandalf just like, fly, you fools, and that's it. And you don't get to see what actually well, happens after until you later. you shall not pass. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then the others, but, yes. I mean, that's really what her moment was, was standing up to yes. Vader. So she has that moment, and then it's like, that's the end. So to me, I think she's going to come back. It could be as a Force ghost in some different way, in some more powerful way. So I guess as I'm saying this, I'm like, yeah, Force ghost totally makes sense. Um, so I think we're going to see her again, just more powerful. I, don't I think hope you're she's... right. I totally hope you're right. We'll I would love we'll it. We'll see. I don't know. I'm, I I have no idea. So I have no idea. Mark? I, I, I want to see Force ghost, but John swayed me, and I'm a huge Bon Jovi fan, so I think she comes back. <laughs> Why would she be boring. walking back into the temple? She totally got like in a massive fight. She's injured, and she's just like, dirt, dirt, Vader's injured, too, and and the the... The, the crew got limping away. Off, though. You know, her mission was done. They got away. No, nah. they, they should have put an exclamation point on the finish and not had it be ambiguous. Uh, all right, what's next? Well, last we, one. We have one more. This is the last Twitter question of the day, and it comes from Sarah. What do you think about Ray becoming a Sith baby instead? Hashtag plot twist, <laughs> indeed, Miss Johnson. I've we, there's been this picture that's been floating around Looks a long awesome. time. With her as a uh, Sith yeah. and him a, as and, a Jedi. Yeah, as Kylo oh as a Jedi. God, no. I actually, and I think I said a couple times, and you had the, the same reaction awesome. when I said it too. I would love if they ended the if they ended Episode Nine with Ray as an evil Sith Lord. I would love that. It would be ballsy. There's no way they're going to do it, but I think it would be amazing and a great way to take us into episode 10, 11, and 12 if she indeed was like a powerful Sith Lord. Uh, that would be great. They just There's no way they'll do it. Absolutely they'll do it. You think they're going to no, do no, it? No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> let, me, let me rephrase that. Let me, I'm not saying they're going to do it, but would they do it? Damn right they would do it. You know why? Because Kathleen Kennedy's a badass. That's yeah. why. Because right. just think about this. And remember, they kind of like following themes mm-hmm. that they've had in stars so far, right? And let's look back to Anakin. Mm-hmm. Young Anakin, worried about him going to the dark side. If she has a lineage to Sidious, and Luke has been worried about that, trying yep. to protect her, whatever. Well, that didn't work out so well for Anakin. Doesn't work out so well for Rey. Opens up a world. Because a lot of people are asking, where do you go after episode nine? You know where you go? The new terror to the galaxy is, is Rey Sidious. Yeah. That's where the new terror Rey of the galaxy Sidious. is. That would be awesome. I'm not saying that's what they're going to do, but I totally believe they would do it 
if if that's what they want to do well, i think they do it i totally do think when you're following themes that if they went back to vader and it's like it's telling the story backwards we're getting to know her as a hero to begin with and then seeing that journey go there and we talked about earlier where it's like all it takes is one moment han solo could be a piece of that puzzle for her going to the other side where it's like he went away there's a like piece of her heart that's broken and it's like okay keep moving in that direction it would be awesome mark hates this <laughs> <laughs> you were the chosen one. <laughs> Did you, no, no, I don't want to see that. You're yeah. just you're you're building up all this great female empowerment, and yes, women are going to be a force for good in Star Wars. And then we're taking this great female lead character, this amazing performance by Daisy Ridley. Everybody's in love with her. She smiles on Instagram. She inspires <laughs> humans and dogs all over the world. And then we make her evil. You can't do that to me. Not again, Star Wars. Uh, you're, it's a good point. It's a good point. I'm telling you, it would what, hurt too bad. Uh, it would right. hurt. That's but the I would point. Like it. You all right. would feel. You're, you're right, though. That is the point. It, it, it's very interesting. I just can't imagine them doing it. You guys it. go to. You guys. You guys turn evil fast. Yeah. Well, I haven't eaten. I like good character arcs. I haven't eaten. Yeah. That would be the best quote by <laughs> Kathleen Kennedy. <laughs> Kathleen, why did you decide to make Ray evil? I had not eaten yeah. all day. No, it was I ten o'clock. I hadn't had, had my coffee. The Snickers commercials. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. That's this episode of Collider oh. Jedi Council. I'd like to thank. Today's council. First of all, the Smith Lord Tiffany Smith. Where can they find you? You guys can find me on social me media. Min minia. Social media. Social mm -hmm. media at Tiffany's Tweets. Uh, you can see me on Fandango Movie Clips. Just did some fun stuff with Slash and James Wan last week for The Conjuring. So if you want to check that stuff out. And tonight. And tonight I will be on the, sh not on the Schmo Down because I'm retired. Yeah. I'll be on Schmo's now. Sitting next to her, it is Obi John Kenobi. John, where can I find you? Uh, you guys can find me on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campy. And of course, you can catch our new show, Film HQ, on Comic Con HQ. And somebody at this desk is actually going to be a guest on this next episode. Me. Tiffany oh, nice. is going to be on the next me. episode. So you can see that it airs on Saturday mornings when it goes up live. So make sure you check that out then. And uh, otherwise, that, yeah, at John Campy. Follow me there. Mark 2D2, Mark Ellis, where can they find you? Optimus Prime and I will be selling Viagra <laughs> on the subway. Check us out for great deals. Mark Ellis Live is the place to be on Twitter, and that's my website where you can get tickets to see me perform stand-up comedy tomorrow night and Saturday at the Ice House in Pasadena, California. For me, Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. And if you're watching this right now, very soon, I'm sure the Schmo Show will be going up 7 to 9 p.m. live on the Schmo's channel. We have a big announcement today. It actually kind of involves, it does, it involves Collider very much. So make sure you go and check that out. And that's it. Make sure you join us next week. May the force be with you. Always. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.